The scripture lesson this morning is taken from Proverbs and also from Colossians. The first Proverbs chapter 6, we'll be reading verses 6 through 8. Here Solomon's advice cuts like the advice that a father would give a child. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. And also from Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. These words were written by Paul some 1,000 years after Solomon. Paul's advice to the Christian households. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. The Word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. What is your word? How do you spend your days? What are you making? What are you getting done? What do you accomplish with your hours? is your work. For those in Christ, there are better questions. Who do you worship in the work that you do? Who are you serving in your labor? Whose glory drives your effort? How does how you do your work reveal the character of God? tomorrow be measured in dollars and hours and completed tasks? <coughs> or will the day be counted in eternity as one spent in service for the King? In the name of Jesus, we will strive for excellence. We will build with integrity. We will create order and beauty. And whatever we do with our hands, our hearts will declare, I am a living sacrifice. This is my offering to you. That is our work. And I had to look that up. I, many of you may know it. I don't know. I didn't. 
And basically it means that they have a, a structure almost like a caste system where they have division of labor and they stay very much in the particular place that they are. So if they're the ones that go out and forage, that's what they always do. If they're the ones that stay and care for the eggs, that's what they always do. But the thing that's unique about them that to um, probably that we can see so much that makes them the one that we would look at as an example is their persistence. They are continually doing whatever it is that they want to do. I had Pharaoh ants in my house in Valrico literally from the day we moved in and my daughter still has them. They're very, very persistent. And once they get started, you know that trail just never stops. It seems like there's a never-ending supply of ants to come and try to find food in your home. And so, indeed, in that persistence, it is a model for work and the idea that the work that we have, we're to get to doing. Will you bow your heads with me? Almighty God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing to you. That you will let me get out of the way so that the message you have for your people is the message that they receive. That regardless of the words that I have to say, that they will receive that which will help, that all of us will receive that which will help us be more faithful to you and to all that you have given us to work. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. There's a gentleman named James Robertson, and James was someone who uh, did work. He was very persistent in his work over the years. He was a native of Detroit and uh, moved to a place called Rochester Hills, not too far outside of it, where he was working in the engineering industry for $10.55 an hour. And he, everything was fine for quite some time. He had a Honda Accord that he drove back and forth the 21 mile round trip. When his Honda Accord conked out, he decided that he would walk. So he walked 21 miles round trip every day. And he did that in rain or snow, sun or, or uh, clouds, it didn't matter. Occasionally he took a bus and sometimes co-workers might help him give by giving him a ride. Um, he did this day in and day out, always making it to work on time. Never missed a day of work. He always got there. Well, over time, he became a friend with a man named Blake Pollock. And that was about eight and a half years in walking 21 miles every day. And Blake was a financial executive, and he traveled along the same route. So every time he saw um, Mr. Robertson, he would pick him up and take him the rest of the way. Well, he was telling a friend of his, Evan Leedy, who was a 19-year-old, he was telling this 19-year-old about what was happening with Mr. Robertson. Really, all he wanted was to get good, solid transportation. He thought a poor Taurus would be the best thing. So Mr. Leedy put on a website called GoFundMe a page for Mr. Robertson, unbeknownst to Mr. Robertson, saying, telling his story about how he's walking, how he's being faithful to, uh, you know, the fact that he doesn't have the money to, to have a car, and asking for them to raise $5,000. Well, Mr. Robertson's story touched so many people's hearts, instead they raised $300,000. So they presented a brand new Ford Taurus to Mr. Robertson and gave him some investors who would help him manage the remaining money. He said, I'm not the hero in this story. It's all those people who donated the money. And he said that he would not stop working. He said, it's what I've always done. I, I cannot imagine not working. Sounds like that same diligence that the ants have, doesn't it? And this humble man was helped by someone who didn't even know him. The Bible presumes that we will work. Even in the garden, as we talked a couple weeks ago about Adam and Eve, 
They were given the work of the stewardship of the garden. And we have no less of a responsibility for the stewardship of our garden here on earth that we recycle and reuse and we don't buy things we don't need and all of those things so that our earth will have as little impact on it as possible based on us being on it. Because we've been given that job, given that work. But it's also presumed that we are going to do our daily work. If we look at Thessalonians 3, 7 to 10, it says this, and it's Paul writing. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who was unwilling to work shall not eat. The presumption was that everyone would be willing to work. I'm not sure that he took into account the fact that sometimes there is no work. Sometimes there's um, difficulties where the work is very far from where you live, across the country, and you have the resources to get there. I mean, there is such a much larger community communities that we deal with now than at his time, but there was still the presumption that we would work, that we would be diligent in what we did. But there's also a presumption that we would work in a particular way, that we would find joy in what we do, that we would find purpose in it, and most of all, that we would reveal God through it, because that we would honor God in it. Because when we work in a particular way, in that kind of way, then it can be a witness to other people of who we are in Christ. There was a man who was uh, working on a team of people that were building a new building. And the building, they were stone carvers. And there was came to a crucial point where they needed to have this one particular piece done that day. And the person that was supposed to do it, the master carver, wasn't there. So they asked this other young man to do it, and he didn't have this particular expertise in his skills at this point. But he wanted to be very diligent about what he did, so he was very careful, and he did everything as carefully as he could. And when he was done, he felt that it, it was a good piece of work. But he didn't see the end product until several months later. And when he went and saw, it was a column, the, the column and where it was highlighted and how beautiful it looked, he said, thank God I did my best work. See, when we do our best work, then we always know that we're honoring God. My dad used to ask me when I'd come home from school and, you know, if I did my best work. It, it was okay. Whatever grade I got was okay as long as I did my best. And I think that there's a way in which God looks at us in a similar manner. There was a man that uh, was working for the federal government doing census work and he had to go <laughs> door to door and he had to be dressed a certain way you know, and tie and it was August and it was hot and He's walking from door to door, and he figured out after a little bit that he shouldn't introduce himself and take a long time to tell them that he's not selling anything because the doors would slam in his face. So finally, he started saying immediately, hi, you know, my name is Bob Perks, and we're doing a survey. I'm not selling anything. <laughs> Excuse me. So one day, there was a young woman inside the doorway, and she paused for a moment when he asked to come in and talk to her, and um, she said, well, all right, the place is a mess because I've got a number of kids and it's hard to corral them all, but you're welcome to come in. And so it was an older home in a section that was um, where people had meager income and could barely afford shelter. And she he asked, said, I need to ask a few questions about yourself, but I don't need your names or anything like that. I just need to answer the questions. 
she interrupted and said, would you like a glass of cold water? It looks like it's been a hard day for you. And he said yes, and she brought the water to him, and as she was coming back in, her husband Joe walked through the door, and she said, um, Joe, this man is here to do a survey. And so Mr. Perks stood up, and they introduced themselves, and he looked at Joe, and Joe was a, a, a tall, kind of lean, but, you know, muscled man, and he had the hands of someone who did hard work. And um, he said, uh, she said, well, Joe works for the borough. And he asked him, well, what kind of work do you do? And before he could answer, his wife said, he collects garbage. I'm so proud of him. And they had had a, a, a loving moment when he had come in and sat down. And he said, honey, I'm sure the man doesn't want to hear all that stuff about us. And he said, no, really, I do. And she said, you see, Bob, my husband is the best garbage man. He gets more in his truck than anybody else. He's figured out the way to do the routes so that they're more efficient. And so the entire team works better because my husband's there. He said, that's incredible. Most people would be, you know, really not wanting to do that kind of work. They would, you know, gripe about that job. It's a hard job. Their attitude's amazing. Well, so then she walked over and she took hold of some framed, uh, framed piece that was by the door. And she said, I don't think the measure of a man is his work. The measure of the work, the work is the measure of the man. Let me do that one more time. <laughs> I don't think that the work is the measure of the man. The measure of the man is how he does his work. And she said that, they needed to move to this borough because they had been on welfare for a long time and he couldn't find work. And so when he found work and came home, he, he felt disheartened because he wasn't even going to make as much as when they were on welfare. We still need to be ready to do the work that God calls us to. Because God doesn't often call at just the right time. There was a man who was a deacon in a church, and he was uh, had had an epiphany during a, a spiritual revival, and he decided that it was time that he needed to do work for the church. And so he went to the pastor, and he said, whatever you need, I will do it. You just call me, and I will take care of it. Well, soon after, there was a young woman that called. It was a widow, a young widower. She had... Um, a few kids, and one of them needed to go to the doctor 50 miles away, and she had no transportation. And she wanted somebody to drive her son to the doctor. So the pastor called up the deacon and said, if you wanted to do something, this is what I'd like for you to do. He said, but I have work that day. I, I can't do that. He said, well, can you not get the time off? He said, well, yeah, I could. And so he did. He picked up the young boy. They are driving along, and the boy looks at him, and he says, Sir, are you God? And the deacon laughed a little bit and said, uh, No, I'm not God. I'm just a man. He said, Why did you ask that? And the little boy said, Well, last night my mom was praying to God and asking God to do something about getting me to my appointment. And I figured since someone came that it must be God. He said, no, I'm not God. The little boy finally said, well, if you're not God, do you work for God? <laughs> and it suddenly dawned on the deacon that yes, indeed, he did. And so he said, yes, yes, son, I do work for God. We all do. Whether it's in our paid work or our volunteer work, whether it's in the church or in the community, we're to work as though we are working for God himself. In our Colossians uh, verses, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. This was originally said to slaves. I think it applies to all of us because all of us have someone over us. Now, unlike slaves, we have choices to walk away from them too often, but 
We all have someone who's over us. For working any place, even if you're at a high level, there's a boss over you, or maybe a board of directors, or uh, even stockholders in, a, in some you know, corporations. But always above that is our God. He is the one for whom we work. It is the Lord Christ we are serving, as it says in the scripture. There, uh, there's the rest of the story about the garbage man. The woman explained about having to move where they did and how they weren't earning as much as even on welfare. She walked over to her husband and she said, I love my Joe, and I've always been proud of him. The job doesn't make him, the man makes the job. So when they moved in to the little place that they were living in, what was hanging on the wall was there, and it said this. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep the streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep the streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well, Martin Luther King Jr. I love him for who he is, but what he does, he does the best. I love my garbage man. You see, she understood that even in the jobs that nobody wants, there is honor in work. And that in our work, even picking up garbage, we can honor and glorify God's name. That truly, we aren't our work. We are Christians who work. And that changes everything. Now, I have one caution in that. And that is this, that we need to balance work with rest. God gave us the model. He worked six days and rested. We need rest. We need rest to restore our spiritual lives. We need rest for our family, to be with our families, our friends, those who are important to us. Rather than being like the little girl who went to her daddy, came home, and he had a big important job, and he worked a lot. And he came home one day, and she said, Daddy, how much does an hour of your time cost? You know, like at your business, how much does it cost? And he said, well, $150. And out. She said, Well then, Daddy, can I have twenty dollars? I said, Why? Well, hey, what's what's this about? What do you want the money for? And she took him in her room where she had opened up her piggy bank and found that she had hundred and thirty dollars in there. She was just twenty dollars short of being able to spend an hour with her daddy. I don't want to be in that situation. We don't want to be in the situation where we, the work that we do becomes an idol to us and the work is more important than the people that God has put in our lives. No matter what work we do, it is honorable. Whether we're working for pay, we're retired, whether we're volunteering, wherever we're volunteering, you may think that it's just a simple thing that you take a casserole to a neighbor. It's doing work for God. It's showing God's love. Oh, and good work. And in our work, we show who Jesus is. For he inhabits all of it. You bow your heads with me. Almighty God, we thank you for work, for the joy it can be in our lives, for the ways that it shapes us and changes us, for how we can be used by you, even in what we think might be menial or unimportant work, that still there can be work for you in the midst of it. Help us to be those people who radiate what you've done in our lives.
to those that we work for, that we work with, to our customers, to our friends, to those we volunteer with and for, for all the ways that we are active doing things for you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.